Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library here with Bill Getty talking about uh, feathers in his series um, Introduction to Ornithology. It's a five-part series that we're going to be we're doing all year long. So I hope you can come to as many as possible because every time um, we have one of these we learn so much. Um, just quickly I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programs and um, and you can find Bill, uh, I will be recording the session and I will uh, send out the video link to everybody afterwards. Um, Bill Getty, as you know, is an amazing speaker about all kinds of topics. This time we're talking about birding and like I said, feathers, but he's also a photographer. All of the pictures that he shows you are his own. So I hope you enjoy his talk and we. I will be turning the chat off during the presentation. I'll turn it back on. Um, when he's done. And if you have questions, put them in the q and I will be um, asking those of Bill once he's done with his presentation. So welcome, Bill. Once again, it's always good to see you. Well, thank you very much, Mina. It's always a pleasure to work with you and good afternoon, folks. And uh, uh, just libraries to me are the most important um, civil institutions. And so if you could support your library, and that's even if you're in Iowa, you could send a donation to the National Library. I mean, that would be a good thing. In any case, so it's stupid, Bill, is, Bill, I just yeah. want to say that we're in Ashland, Massachusetts. So if you're going to send that donation, make sure it's to Ashland, Massachusetts. There's 17 Ashlands in the United States. Okay, well, the Ashland in Massachusetts for sure. But Thank you. Hey, support <laughs> your libraries. Okay, yeah. in terms of uh, introduction to ornithology, feathers. Feathers are just one of these in incredible things in nature. And so what we're going to be doing during our presentation this afternoon is with the origin of feathers. Where do feathers come from? What are they, really? I mean, I mean, I think everybody knows what a feather is, but what really are feathers? The anatomy of feather. We're going to take a look at feathers and, and show you the structure of the feathers. Uh, feather definitions. There are many di different types of feathers. A lot of folks think, well, they, they have a feathers, but no, there are many, many types of feathers on birds. Talk about feather grow, growth, the types and functions of the various different feathers. Feathers that come in different shapes for different purposes. Uh, attachment of feathers. Of course, when you look at most birds, except turkey vultures, for example, they have feathers that cover their entire body, but they're not attached all over their body. And we'll talk about that. Uh, feather care. Okay, now think of birds. Most birds will have feathers for at least six months, the same feathers for at least six months. They have to take care of them. Yeah? Just imagine wearing the same clothes outside 24 hours a day. You'd have to take really good care of them. Okay. Talk about feather molt. Why? Why do birds molt? Feather, feather coloration, and then into a summary. And by the way, this is the back of an oscillated turkey. These are the feathers on the back of an oscillated turkey. Oscillated turkeys are are relatively common where they're not persecuted and shot in places like Belize and Southern Mexico and things like that. And as you can see, it's just an extraordinary, um, imagine a, a gown make it, made out of those colors, be spectacular, okay? Well, the fossil record, many species of dinosaurs had feathers, okay? And especially the dinosaur, a lot of research out of China with the dinosaurs they found, most of them had feathers. Well, the whole point of it, modern birds are in fact dinosaurs. We just happen to call them birds. The only animals that have had feathers are dinosaurs and are modern birds. And so this is just an example from the National Geographic of a, a bird that was covered, I mean, a dinosaur that was covered by feathers. Well, a lot of reasons why you want feathers. You want feathers to keep warm. You want feathers to display for a mate, all kinds of different reasons, okay? And so why feathers? Well, they a bunch of different reasons. First of all, thermoregulation to keep a bird warm or cold, cool, very, very important. Protection from the weather, from dirt, from parasites, just like your clothing would be. Coloration to enhance sexual selection. Well, you know, female birds are, are really smart, okay? And if they see a male bird of their same species that has spectacular plumage, versus one that doesn't, she'd be much more attracted to him because, well, it proves that he is healthy. It proves to her that he is a provider because he can find food and things of that nature. They, believe it or not, enhance running. It helps keep the feet on the ground. And I'll show you some examples. And then gliding and flying. 
Okay, so some birds are not very good flyers, but they can certainly glide. Okay, and so what are feathers? They're mod uh, modifications of the outer layer of the bird skin at the epidermis, which contains keratin, which is the same as your fingernails and your hair. And keratin is a sulfur cutaneous. They're proteins. Okay, so they make up the, again your hair, nails, and the horns of like a rhinoceros and things of that nature. Okay. So in terms of the anatomy, and this is just one of many types of feathers we'll be call, uh, covering this, this afternoon. So you have a vein, that's that's the length all the way up to the calamus. The calamus is what actually sticks into the um, feather follicle. So once it's outside the feather follicle, it's referred to as the vein. And then you have a rachis. Well, think of it as a tree, the main stem of a tree or a fern, the, 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 the stipe and the uh, portions of the fern, okay? So that so rachis and the vein and the calamus, okay, and this is this is a, a little um, a microscope and I can take photographs through the microscope and this is what a, a close up looks like of the rachis. That's the think of it as a stem or there's the, the trunk of the tree from which off the branches are coming and those are the barbs. Really, first of all, it's a in my view it's a beautiful piece of art. This is just extraordinary. And then if we're looking at it a little bit further on, then you have the, the barbs that I just showed you, but then the barbules and then the little tiny little hooklets, it, Velcro. Okay, we think, you know, humans invented Velcro. No, 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 no. Birds had Velcro for millions of years before we ever thought about it. Those are the little hooks that hook together uh, in order to give the feathers uh, structure. Okay. So in terms of definitions of uh, feathers, Panaceous, and we'll be seeing this in, in the examples as we go forward. They're finely textures, they're tightly interwoven. And that's the, it can be either the entire feather or just portions of the feather. And the pummelaceous is the downy part. You think of down like you'd have feather down, and that those type of feathers are really down like. And again, it can be either just a portion of the feather or the entire feather. And we'll see that again. When I refer to distal, that means away from the point of attachment. So it's sort of towards the tip of the feathers and proximal is near, nearest to the body, nearest to the feather follicle. So these are just some terms that we'll be using as we're going forward. Okay, the process uh, in feather growth, it, like your human hair, okay? They, it only grows from the base, okay? So it's growing up from the bottom and the specialized cells in the feather follicle produce the keratin, like your fingernails or your hair. And the different shapes of the follicles produce different types of feathers. So if you have really downy feathers, that's a different kind of feather follicle than you would say for a flight feather, which is very strongly uh, shaped. And once the feathers are formed, as they grow out, they are now inert. Okay, there, there's no blood supply to them. Uh, and all care to the feathers has to be done external to them. Okay, so this is just illustration of the the artery that's bringing blood into the feather follicle and it grows, the feather grows out of that follicle, okay? So in terms of the types of and functions of feathers, the first one is a body feather. And this is what most people see when they see this is a, a, a duck feather. And this is what you typically will see in my illustration here is only the last 40% of the feather. All the other part from the, the lower part towards the left, that's all covered up by the tips of other feathers, like a shingles on a roof, okay? So that body feathers, they do, they have this central rachis, so that cen central uh, trunk of the tree, if you wish, going through the center. So it, it's basically equal on both sides of the feathers, okay? And the veins are basically symmetrical. The, the upper side looks like the lower side. And no, notice that portion of proximal and nearest to the body is, is this pummelaceous. It's very down-like. It's like, like you would expect if you were getting a, a feather down or getting a feather jacket or something like the down jacket, you, you'd want to see that, that fluff. And the far end is the panaceous, the really fairly structured portion of the feather. So that's, that's what they look like. And 
the, the pinaceous end, the end furthest away from the feather follicle, is to protect the bird from, from the sun's ultraviolet rays, from, from water, from insects. That's the outer, think of that as your, the outer coat of them. And the pumulation, that really downy portion, that is to provide insulation for thermoregulation. So in the same feather, you both have protection at the outer end for against climatic conditions, and the inner part is for to provide um, thermoregulation to help with that. So what? Okay, Bonnie, that's the structure of a body feather. Well, so what? Well, what are they? What are their functions? Okay. Well, here this is a magnificent frigate bird. Well, this is the male. This male is in full display mode here. He's blown up this the pouch. He's lifting up the feathers. And so he's looking skyward for a female that's going to fly over and say, oh, man, boy, is he cool. Okay. So that's what's going on. So it's feathers are very important in terms of visual communications, especially in advertising for breeding readiness. This bird is at the height of his breeding readiness, and he wants any female who's looking for a mate to know it. Okay? Notice he's lifted up his feathers. There's a little bit of shininess to the feathers. It's just... He's extraordinary, okay? Well, body feathers also provide a very important for, uh, thing for cryptic plumage. This is an Eastern screech owl, an Eastern screech owl sitting in an oak tree and the, basically very, very well camouflaged in here. Typically, the females are more camouflaged than are the males. They have more cryptic plumage. Not always, there are some species where that is the reverse, but the vast majority of birds, the, the, the males and the females have slightly different plumage. In this case, the females are typically much, uh, much more cryptic. This is really, from a distance, this bird is really hard to see against its background. Okay. Well, here is talk about cryptic plumage. Okay, you might not even see the bird. The bird is sitting with its head straight up in the air, with his beak facing sort of at 10 o'clock. This is a common potu. This is a bird that during the day, the entire daylight hours, it sits on top of a stump or a twig or a branch or something like, like this one is, and just sits there with its cryptic plumage. So hopefully that nobody, no predator will see it. I hope everybody's seeing it. Okay, this the left third of the image, there's a stump. Sitting on top of the stump is a bird with its beak up to the at 10 o'clock. Talk about cryptic plumage, okay? And other things, uh, counter coloring. This is a common myrrh. It's a group of the alcid, uh, alcid group of birds, alcids. And they all typically have a white underside versus a black upper side. Well, why? Well, if this bird is sitting on the water, on the ocean, typically these are all ocean birds, Okay, a predator that's underneath looking up towards the bright sky are going to see a white belly against a bright sky. Okay, if it's a predator looking down on the bird against the dark water, they're going to see the dark back against the dark water. So it's counter coloring for, again, providing uh, some camouflage. Other body feathers, this is a barred owl. Okay, if you have difficulty, if you're outside or something, and you're having difficulty hearing, sometimes you put your hands up around your ears to hold them in, in order to cut and collect more of the sound waves. Well, that's exactly what this bird, those feathers are acting as if you're putting your feather, your hands up against your ears in order to improve your hearing. That disc-like face and cup shape. And in a, in a few numbers of species, this is this is amazing. This is a sand grouse. This is a photograph I took in Tanzania, and this is these are male sand grouse. Well, there's not a lot of water uh, in parts of East Africa at certain times of the year, so these males they have special structures on the feathers, specially shaped feathers, that they can go when they find a puddle of water like this, they can walk into the water the water gets into these little cup-shaped feathers that they have on their breast, and then they fly home to their mate or to their young ones, and they crawl underneath and they drink water. Pretty amazing, okay? So those are those are body feathers, remages. These are the, the wing flight feathers, okay? 
So these include the primaries, the secondary, and the tertials. And here's the example, and this is a golden crown kinglet, a bird smaller than is our uh, black cap chickadee. Notice the primary feathers with the outlined here with the, the, the red line. Those are the outer ones. And then you have the secondaries and then the tertials. There's several three to four feathers right at the base of the wings. Okay. And they are characterized, those feathers are characterized like this one is. Notice it has a full central rachis, like the trunk of the tree again. It's very, the, the veins are very asymmetrical. One side is much, much narrower than is the other side. That's typical of it. So if you pick one up on, from the ground and look at it, you could say, oh, this is a flight feather because look at the shape of this thing. The other thing is the almost the entire vein is pinaceous. There is no um, plumage. There's no, um, uh, you know, uh, pumulations, no plumes for insulation at the base because these feathers are way, way out at the end of the wing. Okay, it's not trying to keep the body warm. So what do they, they provide lift and propulsion. Okay, this is a immature bald eagle that you're seeing here. And so that those are, think of the outer feathers, the primary feathers, ones at the very end of the wing is sort of the propellers, okay? okay? And they do things, they produce sound for important uh, courtship displays. So before, beside flight, they can also uh, be used for courtship displays. And in the eastern part of the United States, uh, eastern half of the United States, we have American woodcocks. And by the way, this is the time that you should be going out in, in, in fields, sort of wetland areas at the edges of forest, and start listening for the calls um, of the, uh, the American woodcock males, because this is the start of their breeding season. So this is a woodcock that you see on the left-hand side. Okay, and notice the outer primary feathers, those with marked with the red arrow. Those are tiny little feathers. When it does its courtship display, it sort of sits on the well, stands on the ground, and sort of walks around in a really tight circle, going paint, 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 paint. And then at some time, it then flies way high up in the air, and those outer feathers vibrate, making a sound. And they'll go fly up high, high. Those feathers making, and then they come zoom right back down to where they started, and they go start again, ping, 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 moving around, and they fly up again. So that's a structure to make sound. So flight and for sound production. Okay, the retroces or tail feathers. So if you say the bird has tail feathers, that's perfectly acceptable. The scientific name is retroces. Those are the tail feathers. And notice again, they uh, they have a central rachis, like the, the flight feathers in the wing, okay? They're asymmetrical again, but notice at the base of the feathers, there's a little bit of this plume-like, fluffy part of the feathers because that whether where these feathers are inserted into the body, they need a little bit of insulation to protect the, the, the skin around where the feather follicle is. So the distal part is, again, firmly structured. And when I'm talking about firmly structured, this is a feather. I mean, if I'm really, this is very, very stiff, okay? So when I say firmly structured, that's what I'm referring to, okay? And the retroces, they, they provide lift, okay? If you, um, red-tailed hawks, for an example, but turkey vultures also, things of that nature. You'll see them soaring up in the sky, especially on a warm day. Well, you'll notice that they have their tail feathers, the retroces fanned out, like this image is where the red arrow is. And that's able, that's making a large surface area, trying to increase the surface area for updrafts and thermals. As the ground heats, the air starts to rise. So these birds fan their wings out as much as they can. They fan their tail in order to take advantage of these updraft air uh, in order to gain elevation. And, so, and, and for some swimming birds, their tails are very important in, as a rudder so that when they're swimming underwater, they can make quick uh, turns. On woodpeckers, if you notice, if you have a downy woodpecker, hairy woodpecker, this is a pileated or pileated woodpecker, they have these very, very strong 
tail feathers, which is you notice them, they look like, like spikes almost on the end. Well, they are very, very stiff in order to provide uh, uh, support as the woodpecker is moving up a tree, um, you know, looking and listening for insects. Really important. And is there any question in your mind that this male wild turkey is trying to be noticed? Well, this, this is certainly in terms of communication. It's trying to tell any eligible female that's around that, that he is healthy, uh, he's an adult, he knows what he's supposed to do at breeding season, and he's trying to, to, trying to attract it. So not only does he fan those feathers to make that beautiful appearance you hear, but it also rubs them together. So it makes, makes a rustling sound. So when these, when these birds are in, in real display, it's really an amazing thing to watch and to listen to. So the fourth type is, is semi-plumes. Semi-plumes are located under the body feathers and are not visible. So if you look at a bird, you never see these things because they're all the way underneath the body feathers where they're out of view. And so they they have a central rachis sort of when it goes about halfway out the feather, but no, 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 it's all plume-like. It's downy texture throughout the feather. Well, this feather is designed to really, it's, it's an, an intermediate form between Panaceous body feathers and the pomulaceous down feathers. They have long rachis. Okay. But what, what did they do? What did these things do? Well, they provide insulation. So here's a beautiful mute swan. You don't see any of these semi plumes in this image because they're all covered up by the body feathers. So that's one really important thing is insulation. The other thing that I think a lot of folks don't think about is, well, if you've ever seen you have a chicken or a duck or something that you're going to be cooking, there's nothing at all that looks aerodynamic about it, okay? Well, underneath the body feathers, things like there, there are a lot of these semi-plumes that help to fill in the, sort of the, the bumps and the, the hollows in the body to provide the bird with a more aerodynamic shape. Really good aerodynamic shape is really important to reduce the amount of drag when the when the bird is flying. So that's it. Okay, the fifth is this adult down and natal down. Okay, these are like same These are located under the body feather and not visible. Okay, they have no basically no central rachis at all. It's just it's just fluff. Well, that's that's all they want. They want fluff. Okay. Because no, notice here is a herring gull chick. Those little feathers were after their first hatch. They get those feathers, they provide insulation. And they provide some level of camouflage for these young birds because the plumage of these feathers are typically very dark so they can hide among the rocks and things of that nature. Yeah. And this is a common eider. So if you ever have a eider um, down comforter or eider down coat or something in like that, you're getting the feathers from this female. And many female ducks use actually pluck these feathers, this adult down out of their breast and other parts of the body in order to make their nests. Okay. So this is an image I took uh, in Iceland. Okay. This is a farmer out here in Iceland. He has this little pond with a little island in the middle of it, okay? And he's put rocks in some places. They put automobile tires, which makes it a good place for the females to have her nest. And so she'll get into the, the either among the rocks or in the um, to auto tire. Uh, and they, they pull the down out of their breast and make their nest out of it. Now that down helps to insulate the eggs against the cold ground, but also when the female goes out to feed, she takes those feathers and she covers over her eggs as camouflage to help keep them warm. Well, at the end of the season, the farmers can go out there and they can collect up this eider down. And that's what they use to make eider down vests and eider down checks. So you can get your down without having to shoot the duck. Okay. And phyloplumes, this is a, a feather that I think the vast majority of people have never seen. They're more like hair, um, and they're located near the flight feathers. So you have a flight feather, say, um, the, 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 the outer primary feathers and things like that. Well, this is this, these feathers are located right next to it. And it's a, it doesn't even look like a feather, but it is. It has a long rachis with short barbs at the end. Again, looks more like a hair than anything. Well, what are these things for? Well, these 
think of the the pilot. She's she's flying from Boston to Newark. Okay. Well, when she's flying, she needs to know where the rudder is. She needs to know where the wing flaps are, and she has all these instruments that are telling her where, where what is the angle of the flaps and what's the angle of the rudder. Okay, getting all this. Well, the birds when they're flying, they need that too. They need to know that also. So these little phyloplumes monitor the movement and position of the flight feathers. So you have a feather with this feather right next to it, and it's monitoring the movement of that larger flight feather. Pretty amazing. Basically, it's telling the brain what is the orientation of those feathers and the relative to the airflow. So it aids in the bird understanding, makes it possible for them to fly well. They also monitor air airspeed. Lots of different things. Now, only a very few species of birds have powder down, but this is unfortunately a green heron that was hit by a car. But, you know, we try not to let anything go to waste here. And these are powder down. Uh, and for most birds, they have this the powder down throughout their bodies. Okay. That they, and this is, is what they help to use to help clean and take moisture out of their feathers. But in some of birds, like these herons, they have them all in a big group right at their breast. So think of somebody using talcum powder or something like that to, to move over their skin, to dry the skin or between the toes or wherever you put it, okay? Well, this bird has this, this powder down that it can use in the beak and then it can spread it among their feathers in order to get any um, to contaminates out of its feathers. Those, by the way, those are the other feather, only feathers that grow continuously and are not molted. Okay, okay, and again, the the feather barbs they just sort of disintegrate, creating a nice powder that's used in feather care. So it promotes waterproofing. It takes water and slime and blood or whatever else is among the feathers. It's sort of sort of cool. Okay. And the, the, this is, these are rictal bristles. This is a flycatcher. And a lot of flycatchers, especially nocturnal flycatchers, like whippoorwills and chuckwills widows and common parakis and things of like that, have these rictal bristles that you see outlined in my uh, with my red arrow here. And these are to basically serve two functions, okay? They, uh, they, they have a rachis and very few barbs, and they're found exclusively on the heads of birds, okay? So they serve a couple of purposes. They, they protect the eyes, okay? So if you're flying after an insect, uh, you don't wanna sort of miss the insect by a little bit and have it hit your eye. If you have those rictal bristles out in the front, you can detect where that insect is and maybe move your mouth a little bit or whatever. Um, and they also uh, for sort of, for, think of a sort of like, like nets on sort of really the night feeding birds like whippoorwills, chuckwills, widows, and things like that. They have very long uh, bristles that actually help them inform them as to where their insect is relative to their mouth as they're flying after the insect in very low light conditions. So we have the feather, different feather types that are important. So in terms of attachment, the feathers are attached sort of like shingles on the roof of a building. Okay? And the Basically, the feather veins of one cover the, the base of the next one, the feather below, just again, just like shingles on a roof. This happens to be a female mallard. And so in terms of the patterns of attachment, well, all bird species have feathers covering their entire bodies, ex except their heads on, on storks and, and um, like wood storks, things like jabiru stork and things like that. They are not typically attached all over their body. Only a few species have the feathers that are actually, the, the feather follicles are all evenly spaced across their body. So this is an example, these are feather tracks, and this is a uh, Nestle Purple Martin. If you can see where my arrow is, that's, uh, th those are, the feathers are growing in tracks, and then they're open space where there are no feathers attached, and then another track, okay? And so why are these feather tracks are important? Well, they they can, this is a hooded merganser, one of my favorite birds, by the way. Here's a male with his hood down. He's he's feeding, he's minding his own business. Ooh, but then if there's another male or a potential, another male encroaching on his territory or a female around, he can lift those feathers up because those feathers on his head 
are in tracks and those tracks are controlled by muscles. So if he wants to lift up his crest, he tenses those muscles and the feathers go up. Okay. This is the apteria, the spaces between whether the feathers are tacked, between the feather tracks. These are areas uh, that are open space. They're, the feathers cover that spot, but there are no feathers attached to that spot. Those are called apteria. And those have a really important pur purpose. I'll show you in a moment. But there are a small number of, of species I mentioned before that don't have feather tracks. The feathers are uniformly attached all over the body. This is a Somali ostrich. Okay. Well, they don't fly. Okay, so having feathers attached all over the body is, is no uh, impediment to wing movement or anything like that. Makes good sense. But these apteria facilitate the movement of the wings and the legs. There's nothing in the way to interfere with muscle, uh, muscle movement and leg and wing movement. Okay. Here's an example. This is a hairy gull. I took I, this photograph in January, as I remember. Okay, remember just just as the, the pilot, she's taking off or wherever she's taking off with, and she, the plane is off the ground and you hear a noise underneath and the wheels are brought up into the fuselage of the airplane. Well, this is what this uh, gull has done here. It's very cold. And so what it's done is bring, brought its foot up into the apteria. In other words, he opens up the feathers in the feather tracks, bring this foot up into the apteria, the bare part of flesh, and then closes the feathers around it again, okay? It conserves heat in cold weather. And for some flying birds, they wrap their, their legs up into their body feathers, just like the airplane and put the wheels up into the fuselage to make it more aerodynamic, okay? Here's another of these sort of birds just sort of just, in order to protect and be a little bit warm, this very, very cold day, they can tuck their heads into the apteria too. So they, again, the bill is up against their bare flesh. Okay, okay here's a, this is a, a greater roadrunner. These are birds of the desert southwest of the United States and then further south too. Well, this is, I took this photograph in January. Um, I'm in New Mexico uh, and it's a relatively cold morning, but it's a very sunny day. So what this bird has done is turned its back to the sun and it's opened up its feathers to expose the apteria to the warmer rays of the sun in order to warm itself up. It can also, if it's really hot, it can also get in a shady place, open up the feathers, expose the apteria to, in order to uh, remove heat. Okay, if you, if you count this image right here, we have an adult bird and I count one, two, I count at least five legs underneath there. Well, birds only have two, okay? So this is a, a female, uh, especially when she's incubating her eggs, okay? Her feathers provide such a level of protection that if she sat on her eggs with the feathers between her body and the eggs, she couldn't get any heat into those eggs to help incubate them. So she needs to open up those feathers, expose the apteria, called a brood patch, and then sit on the eggs so that the eggs are right up against her bare body, okay? Okay, or another thing in caring for the young ones, the small, tiny little, uh, these are piping plovers, okay, the male or the, or the female can both do it. They open up those feathers, expose the apteria so the little ones can crawl underneath and be warm and also protected from potential predators. Okay. Feather care, as I said before, the feathers are inert once they grow just like your hair. Okay, they're not getting any nutrients from, from your scalp or anything like that. There's no internal flow of nutrients. And so all the feather care has to be done external to the feather. And there's all kinds of bad things can go on wrong if you don't have maintained feathers. Well, first of all, they can lose their insulating properties. That's, that's one thing. Birds can come to heat loss, hypothermia. Damaged or misaligned feathers can, can cause real problems with flight. Because if you have bent or broken or badly decayed feathers, uh, it, it, you're not very aerodynamic. You increase the amount of drag and de decrease the amount of lift. You, you don't want to do that, okay? And if you're a bird that's in the water, I mean, 
feathers are badly messed up, uh, you lose your buoyancy, right? Uh, and of course, if you have damaged feathers, just uh, more pre prone to parasite infestations like that. So these are just type things. So uropygial gland, this is a cool one. Uh, most most passerine forms, as the songbirds, that's like 51% of all the birds on the earth. They, they have this gland that, there are two things going on here. Number one is, this is uh, from Brazil, a uh, photograph from Brazil. And these two birds, it's early morning, and these two uh, gira cuckoos are sitting with their back to the sun. They've opened up their feathers to expose their body, the aperia, to the sunlight. And when they're doing this, now they expose the uropygial gland. And those are glands, as you can see at the, at the at base of the back, that produce oil of waxes and things. And just think that it's like hand cream or something. They make this, this waxy, fatty things, and they then use their beak to take that wax and put it through their feathers in order to, just like putting on hand cream in order to protect her or conditioner after you have a shower or something. So uropygial glands, they apply it with a feather. The oil helps in maintaining the, the moisture in the flexibility of the feathers. That's really important. And that um, the waxy material coming from the uropygial gland is, is important in controlling bacteria and fungi. So basically flying around with its own medicine kit right on its back and hand cream. Feather can by preening, okay? They'll be rubbing their feathers. This is a gray catbird, okay? And it's going using its bill to go through the feathers and removing any dirt that might be there, any parasites that might be there. Uh, if it has new feathers to take the old sheath of new feathers as they're being formed. It's really, it's like wandering your clothes and hanging them up and brushing with a brush. That's what they're doing to, to maintain them. Here's, this is a Sage Phoebe. Well, boy, it's looking under its wing to see if there are any parasites, there's any dirt underneath there. And it was spending a lot of time just, again, lifting up its wing and, uh, and preening itself underneath the wing to align those feathers. Remember those hooklets I showed you in the feather? Well, if they're unaligned or not misaligned, they want to straighten them and put them again so they're in perfect alignment, so the feathers are in perfect shape. Okay. And this is, these are these are Canada geese. This was, um, I took this photograph in, I think it was in September. And, and by the way, note the feathers that are on the ground here. What these birds were doing is they were pulling out their old feathers so new, now they weren't pulling them all out, they're just pulling out a few of it at a time, but they were pulling out their old feathers, just dropping them on the ground, so that new feathers would grow back in their place. Okay. If you just took a, a, on a bird and you just cut some of its feathers, they would not grow back until the next season when they are to be, uh, to have new feathers. But if you pull it out, that feather will be uh, replaced starting immediately. And dirt dust baths, okay? Maybe you've had a, a lot of birds, uh, especially house sparrows, I see it a lot. You'll see them in the ground, make, making a little hole in the dirt and, and just getting dust and stirring themselves up in dust as a way to remove parasites, okay? Or sunbathing. This is a turkey vulture in the early morning. It's exposing its underwings to the early morning sun to let the ultraviolet rays get in there to reduce the amount of fungus and bacteria that's underneath there. And besides, it feels good, okay? Now, a lot of seabirds that are out in the ocean where it's very salty. Salty is very corrosive to feathers and everything else, okay? But very often what they will do is they'll, they'll fly into a freshwater pond or a major river, like in my area, the Merrimack River, okay? Because even as a river is flowing into the ocean, the fresh water is lighter than is the salt water and tends to, lens on top of the water tends to be less salty than the water just a few inches below. So they'll come either into a freshwater pond or something like that to bathe and get that salty water out of their feathers. It also removes parasites and dirts and dirt and anything else. This happens to be a long-tailed duck. This is in its breeding plumage, and this was in Churchill, Manitoba, Canada. Okay. This, this bird, I watched this for quite a long. This is a American goldfinch. And this is, after rain, this is this beautiful puddle. And 
I don't know about you, but it looks like he's having a great time in the left hand image here. So a male American goldfinch. And anting, this is sort of, okay, birds will often go and they will sit or right on top of an ant colony and let the birds go through their plumage looking for food, okay? That, that's one thing they can do. Okay? The ants see, oh, my, this is a nice uh, lice, the louse in there, and they'll eat it, yeah, really good. Uh, and, and some birds actually take the ants and crush it, okay? And then crush the ant, and then the formic acid in the ant, they use that ant and then rub it through their plumage uh, in order to uh, assist in the, in the feather maintenance because that formic acid helps to kill insects and fungus and bacteria. Okay, so you you either let the ants crawl all over you taking away parasites or you crush them in your beak and you rub the ant through your body to, to get that formic acid in your feathers. This is an example of an American crow. Okay, there was a small ant colony right here on the on the lawn, and he just came down and sat right in the middle of the ants and let them just walk all over him looking for um, anything, any parasites. Well, there's mutual preening also. Okay, these are two razor bills photographed off this coast of Maine. Okay, and so what they're doing is they're preening each other. Okay. Well, you'll see monkeys doing, they'll get in the group and they'll be going through each other's fur, taking out ticks and eating the ticks or lice or whatever they find. Okay. Okay. So it's common among some mammals and also among birds. So the mutual pre allo preening or preening each other. Well, it also serves another purpose. It's, it's part of the pair bonding. Okay. You know, you scratch my head, scratch, oh, that feels good. That's nice. Oh, nice guy. Anyway. Okay. And so feather mole, the, going on the next subject, feather mole is, what is it? Well, it's a periodic loss and replacement of feathers. And the timing and extent of feather mole varies by species, by the age, and by its gender. All these things are going on. So the mole process, the circannual rhythms, um, birds, humans, everything, we have sophisticated calendars, okay, that tell us what to do when, okay? Uh, and those those cycles, think of it as a calendar, they tell when to migrate, when to get ready for breeding, when to release hormones to trigger feather mole, all things that are going on. And so the new feathers form, begin to form in the feather follicle, and basically they force the old feather out. Okay? And feather mole doing a lot of different things. First of all, you're replacing worn and broken feathers. You can imagine if you have a, you've been outside 24 hours a day, for six months that your feathers are gonna get worn, okay? Well, you need new ones because you're not nearly as uh, efficient flying aerodynamically, things like that. The other thing is, so you need to replace those feathers, it, move in and out of your breeding plumage. Well, a huge advantage of going into your breeding plumage is you can find a mate. The downside of going into your breeding plumage is you become much more visible to a predator, okay? So you wanna go into your uh, breeding plumage, and then go out of your breeding plumage. And especially birds that are making very long range migrations. I mean, we're talking about thousands of miles. They need to be sure that their feathers are in pristine shape in order to make that long migration and, and have the best aerodynamic feathers possible. Okay. And so here is a sequence of feather, but this happens to be a tree swallow. Okay. This is one that we caught at a banding station here. And the replacement, they do it in sequence by track. In other words, if a bird were going to lose all its flight feathers, it once again fly anymore. That's, that's not good for most birds, okay? But notice here, you have those feathers that are sort of the brownish gray. Those are the old feathers. And new feathers are growing in those black feathers, okay? So you can see how the old ones have faded uh, and they're getting these brown, brand new feathers in. Now, when it molts, it molts the same feathers on the left wing as it does on the right wing, okay? So it be it can fly, okay? okay? Now, there are some birds, ducks in particular, that they basically molt all their flight feathers at, at the same time, basically, and they become flightless. If you were along the coast of Maine or Canadian Maritimes in the late summer, 
you will see sometimes literally flocks of hundreds of common eider out in the deeper water at the mouth of bays and so forth. If you approach them on the boat, they can't fly. They can sort of hop along or skim along the water or dive, get away from you because they've lost their flight feathers. That's a different strategy that they they do. So most birds, uh, land birds, they, they, they only do a few at a time. In some of these birds that can, can hide out in the ocean or in large ponds, they can molt their feathers all at one time. And so variations in plumage, feather coloration in many species varies by the gender of the bird, its age, and what season it's in, okay? So, so here are gender specific color, feather coloration. Two, these are mergansers. These are both common mergansers, the female on the left-hand side and the male. Now we're still in winter for a little while longer. Um, they're already in their breeding plumage. Okay, they've already molted earlier in the late in the late fall, very early winter, and they are in their breeding plumage right now. Okay. But here, the male, he's it's really nice for him to be really colorful, gaudy to to attract the potential male, the female. But the female, it's really important that she be cryptically colored, at least certainly more so than is the male because she has to sit on the egg to incubate the eggs and then care, take care of the little ones. So that's important. Purple finches. You know, the bird on the left-hand side, she's not purple, but she's every much been as much a purple finch as the man, the guy on the right-hand side, the male purple finch. Same reason. The females need to be cryptically colored to hide. And age-specific. Some birds take many, for example, a bald eagle takes five years to get its adult plumage. Adult plumage, the white head, completely white head, completely white tail, five years. Many gulls, or the larger gulls, take four years. Well, the, here is a situation where we have two male eider ducks on the right-hand side. Now, so they could be a couple of years old or 20 years old, you can't tell. But the one on the left-hand side, this is either in its first calendar year of life or second calendar year of life. Okay. And so, different plumage. Here's again the bald eagle, okay, the immature bird on the left, and the adult bird on the right. Again, he it's either he or she is either five years old or twenty years old or some other time, some other age. Okay, red winged blackbirds. I took this uh, last spring. If you look at the background. You can see the pond still has ice on it. Okay, so here's an adult, a couple years old, at least. At least, at least hatched the year before the year I photographed it in, in this beautiful plumage. And the one on the is an immature bird. This is a bird I photographed in the in February, uh, and it's not yet in its complete adult plumage. These are both males. And then gender, uh, age, and gender spe specific. These are harlequin ducks. Okay, males and adult males uh, in the middle. And if you look at the the second bird from the right, that's also a male harlequin duck, but it doesn't have its complete plumage yet. And then the females. Okay. And then season specific, well, snow bunting. Well, if you're in the uh, photograph this in Alaska, uh, in Churchill, Manitoba, and in Iceland, okay, I mean, that's, that is what they look like, the male in, this, in the green during the breeding season. You really want to stand out. But in the winter time, you get this plumage that you see on the right-hand side. So very often they're where it's snowy, they're feeding on um, grasslands and, some, and things of that nature. So they can blend in with the uh, ground when they're not as visible. Okay. So the production of color, okay, in these feathers, how did they get this color? Well, they, they can get it from a pigment, okay? or they can get it from the structure of the feather, the microstructure of the feather, or a combination of both, okay? And so pigments are natural occurring chemical compounds, and the, the birds get these compounds from the, the plants or the insects that they eat. Uh, think of a flamingo that's really, really gets really pink. That pink is coming from the brine shrimp that it's eating, okay? And pigments are inserted into the feather as they develop in the follicle. So as that feather is growing out, those pigments are being inserted into that feather, okay? And so different compounds uh, 
absorb specific wavelengths of light and reflect those wavelengths. So we see blue, or we see green, or we see yellow. Okay, uh, and the period and oh, the periodic the, uh, deposits of these give this the, the feather there they're barring. Uh, I'm gonna just hold up this feather. Okay, you see this feather. Okay, you see the white lines and the the dark brown lines. Okay. Think of a feather fo follicle as a circle with a lot of inkjet printers around the side, okay? So as that feather starts going out of the feather follicle, those little inkjets around the feather follicle, they, the um, genetic code says, okay, spray brown. So the brown pigment is put into the feathers. And as the feather goes a little bit more, it says, oh, no, 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 turn them off, turn them off. Now it's going to be white. And then a little bit as the feather continues to go, it says, turn them on again. Now it's brown. And that's how you get these stripes on the feathers. Yeah. Okay, melanins. Okay, these are these dark grays and blacks and browns. And very often you see that on the wingtips of gulls, for example. It's thought to help aid in the uh, given longer life to the, the tips of the feathers. Okay. okay. And then carotenoids, you get these yellows and oranges. What an extraordinary bird, this American goldfinch. And again, the brighter the bird is, is an indication, indicator of its physical health. So then you have other ones that are producing red and brown porphyrins. So that's that, those are pigments. But then you have feather structure. Okay, and think of the word jet of a, I love the word jet of a hummingbird. Here's a word that has two G's in it that are both pronounced differently. Okay, in any case. So these tiny melanin, as that feather is being, going out of the feather is being produced, little crystals of melanin are being inserted into that feather. And those, those different, uh, in the, in, and into the feather barbs. And those, uh, bar, those little crystals uh, scatter different wavelengths of light. So if you see a hummingbird looking at you, it may not have any color, then it turns it a little bit, now it's bright red, turns it back, now it's black. Okay, the black is pigment, the red when it turns its head is the structure of the feathers, similar to a, uh, to a prism. So the, the wavelengths of light are the colors that we see. So the feather structure, the barb, there's a rachis, this, the trunk of the tree, and the barbs and the barbules. So here's the structure. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird on the left-hand side and an azure crown hummingbird from Belize on the right-hand side. So these are excellent examples of how this the structure of the feathers is scattering the light. Here's another, a, a common little uh, mallard. I wanted to get a feather, uh, I mean, a, a photograph of the, the changes in the and and how the movement of the head will change the color. So, Basically, this is the same bird in exactly the same spot. So on the left-hand image, it's the head is turned in one way. Notice the side of the head is really quite black. But when he turns it only a slight amount, from my perspective, now it's this iridescent green. Okay? And then you have color by both pigment and structure. This is a white-winged crossbill. Now there's nothing wrong with this bill. It's supposed to be just like that. They're, they're hooked over. Okay, they don't come and join like this. They're, they hook over. Uh, and so this is a bird typically of boreal forest, spruce, fir, and things of that nature. And they use that bill that's crossed over like a special type of pliers that they they push their bill in between the, the scales. The cones have scales on it. And they push the bill in between those scales, open up their bill and those little prongs separate the scales so the bird can stick its tongue in and pull the seed out. So, and then, then there are color morphs, okay? There are a variety of, of plumage in, in pelage, the hair, things like, here are, these, are, these are snow geese. Now, the one on the left is what most people, that's why they were named snow geese, because of the white. But the one on the right is just as much as the snow geese as the one on the left. It's just a different color morphs, okay? And this is quite common in the mammal world and in the bird world. And they interbreed with each other and they're happy as can be. Okay? Color morphs, perfectly natural. There's, there's nothing wrong with each, either of them, okay? Now, this is really, this is a funny story. This bird that's in the, in the, being held in the hand, 
Uh, I ran the bird banding station. I actually got my bird banding pit permit when I was 16. I had the license and we ran a bird banding station on the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. And our volunteers that work at that station are highly skilled. I mean, they're excellent. Well, they caught this bird that's in the hand. And the, one of the rules in banding is you don't band it unless you know what it is. So they've caught this little bird in the hand. They don't know what it is. They have to let it go. They let it go. And as soon as they let it go, they know what it is. Okay. Because as soon as they let it go, it went chickadee dee dee, chickadee. This was a melanistic chickadee. In other words, its genetic code, genetic code has a problem. Okay. It was sending instructions to the feather follicles to give the wrong color into the feathers. So this is an abnormality in plumage coloration. And it was really funny. That year, we actually caught two of them because we caught one one again, we banded it, we let it go, and we caught a second one. And that didn't have a band, so that was the second one. So there's an overabundance of melanin in the feathers. You don't see this very often, okay? And then there, there's, on the other extreme, there's leucism, leucistic birds. These are birds that do not have enough uh, of the uh, pigmentation, okay? And it, leucism comes from the Latin word, which means white. Well, here, these are sandhill cranes. These are very common uh, birds of the Western part of the country. They're also quite common in Florida, but these are all sandhill cranes here. But notice the one that is in the middle, it is, it's not albino because it has plumage coloration, but it doesn't have enough. And so you have this white bird with these little flecks of brown in it, okay? I was in Alaska last summer and I took these photographs. These are red-breasted mergansers. The one on the left-hand side is what, quote, a normal looking red-breasted merganser. And the one on the right-hand side is a leucistic one. In other words, it still does have some plumage coloration, but not nearly enough. And it was with a male uh, red-breasted merganser. So they were perfectly happy together, okay? Now this is, this is the rarest photograph, my most unusual photograph I have, I've taken thousand, genandromorph. Okay, a genandromorph is something that is both male and female at the same time. So it has the structures of the male and structures of the female in the same bird. Okay. And what happens, this is very rare, okay, but every once in a while, in the very early part of uh, cell development of birds, of the, the multiplication of cells, very early, only at a few cell level, um, it's a mess up. And XY cell normally duplicates its chromosomes to become XXYY and then splits to XY, XY. Okay? But in rare cases, what happens is it splits and it goes X and then XYY in, the, in terms of the chromosomes. So you get something that's a male and something that's female, and this is it. So here is a uh, red uh, rose-breasted grosbeak looking right at you. And if you look at split right down the middle, the right-hand side is the characteristics of a male red-breasted, I mean, rose-breasted grosbeak, and the left-hand side, that of a female. So this is the only one I've ever seen. And I've been bird watching for, for a very long time. Okay, so in summary to our discussion today, uh, we have uh, birds are avian dinosaurs. Okay, so if you if you had grandkids or kids, and you can say, "Gosh, I saw a dinosaur today," and they're going to say, "What?" And I, well, birds are dinosaurs. We just call them birds. Okay, they're basically there are eight types of different feather structures and different function. Certainly the flight feathers are very different than the down feathers in terms of the form and function. The feathers on most birds are grown in feather tracks that are controlled by muscles and there's spacing between those uh, feather tracks where the apteria is for incubating eggs or pulling your leg up into it or opening it in order to either heat up or cool off. And the feather col uh, coloration is caused by either pigment or feather structure or by both. And so, Mina, that's what I have to tell you, talk about today. And so if you have any questions or things like that, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Sure. 
Um, thank you so much, Bill, as always. Um, I'm just going to go through the questions as they came in. Um, Pamela asks, do all bird species have uropigial glands? No, they don't all have them. No, no. There's some of the, like cormorants don't and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Yeah, so okay. Um, and I want to remind everybody, I'm taking questions in the Q&A, not in the chat. So there's a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please put your questions there. Um, Terry asks, is the bottom part of the feather part inside the bird muscle hard or soft when the weather feather is attached to the bird? This part is hard enough to make a, a feather pen and seems like it would be uncomfortable for the bird's body. I mean, when it's growing out, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part of that mean, I'm sorry. Is, is the bottom part of the feather part, oh. the part that's inside the bird well, muscle? The cal part, the cal yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it hard yeah, well, or soft? I, I would think that they, they would be uncomfortable, but that's, uh, I mean, that's part of life, you know, that it, it's growing out. Um, in, in order to uh, sometimes assist that, again, some of the birds will pull out the old feather to make things just a little bit easier. Mm, wow. Okay. Um, Jim asks, is there a food or something else that will attract birds to my backyard, but not the bears? Uh, well, um, mm. probably, uh, probably, well, um, mealworms might do it. Where I wonder where he is that he has bears coming to us. I, I know that New Hampshire and Western Massachusetts and things like that, you know. Yeah, it'd be better not to feed them, I think, for a while. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, I mean, they, I mean, if you put suet out for them or put out seed, the, the bears will the bears will like that. But I mean, you might get away with just having mealworms or something like that. Mm. Oh, interesting. Steve asks, is it illegal to pick up a feather and keep it? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Uh, but nobody will arrest you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, okay. Now, if a hunter shoots a duck and gives you a feather, you can tell the wild, the wildlife officer or the state policeman, no, this came from a, a, a duck that was shot by a hunter. I think that's, I think you'll get away with it. No problem at all. And certainly, I mean, what they're really trying to do that, that law is, Remember the, the National Audubon, I mean, sorry, the Massachusetts Audubon Society started 1896 by two women that were concerned about the feather trade and the feathers being used on hats and fashions. And, and plume hunters were killing millions of birds a year to get the feathers. Mm. Okay, that, that's what that law is in place for. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're using a feather to show a grandkid or, or have one in your collection, I don't think there's a, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just saying, I don't think you'll have any problem. Okay. Is this true for all bird feathers? Um, Deborah says, what about eagle feathers? Oh, well, eagle feather, no, you, you, well, if you're, if you're of a Native American community, um, th that is part of their spiritual experience. And, and, and so that, that's important to them. So I, I think they, that they have, um, they have rights to do that. Mm. But for the rest of us, uh, I think we should just leave them alone. Agreed. Um, why don't we see more feathers that the birds have molted? I have that question too. Well, why don't we see many? Yeah. Well, I don't know. There's some some places you do see a lot of them. Uh, well, I mean, a feather like that, they they uh, when they're not attached to bird, not be cared. I mean, there's a lot of space out there for. If if you go to a places where birds roost, you'll very often find find feathers. But but you know, every bird is replacing its feathers at least once a year. So there are a lot, there are a lot of feathers out there, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe we're just not seeing them. Do they ever molt while they're actually flying? Uh, well, I mean, if the feather is at, at, at the point where it's to, to be replaced, it, yeah, it might fall out when it's flying. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered if that would affect their but, flight. If a bird is migrating, ready to migrate. Okay. Those feathers better be all in place mm -hmm. before it migrates. You know, all the old ones should be gone and new ones. Or in place. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Madeline asks, can color abnormalities that you spoke of, like mutations, also be a mechanism for evolutionary changes in birds? Yes, yes, it could be. Okay. It could it it, it could be also that uh yeah, because um yeah, all those could contribute to the isolation. Um I mean, bird, female birds, when they're looking for a mate, they're listen, either listening for the song. So if I'm singing a song, AAA, and you as a female listening for BBB, okay, we're probably not going to get together, okay? Mm -hmm. And if, if I don't look like I'm supposed to look, 
then that will cause uh, uh, me not to be as attractive to you as, you as you would. So if there are a number of birds that look like me that you don't particularly like, that may start to development of things like subspecies. Mm. Okay. They could interbreed if they came together, but the preference is not to breed with each other. That makes sense too. Well, I think that's all of our questions. I think your presentation really covered, it was so thorough. So I want to say thank you for, again for this wonderful presentation and talk and for everybody who joined us with their questions and listening ears on, because I know that um, we just we just think you're so amazing, Bill. And of course, the pictures, I just love your photography. <laughs> well, thank you, Mina. I always appreciate working with you. It's always a pleasure. Well, thank you. And I will see you in two months with hopefully everybody that's here. I'll send out a recap email with those sessions that are coming up in the next few months. So everybody have a wonderful day. Happy birding to you and Bill. Take care. And I hope that you have some good bird adventures in the next couple of months. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Bye.